the march by the women from Cardiff to demonstrate was amazing. I applaud anyone for demonstrating for a cause that they believe in. However, the women who were left behind and camped outside of the base were disgusting. I cringe every time I drive past what was the main entrance to RAF Greenham Common and see that memorial to those disgusting women. It should be removed as it commemorates disgusting behaviour by the so-called peace women and does not represent a legitimate peaceful protest. Personally, I had some positive experiences of the base between 1983 and 1991. For example, there was a shortage of base housing, so many US military and their families were housed in the surrounding area. Many local people had an American family living next door to them and firm friendships were formed. Many have been maintained to this day with visits to and from the USA. There were many marriages between US military and local residents during the years that the base was active. Two of my own family married US military. While several of the US personnel I worked with also married into the local community. Some wedding receptions certainly benefited as the US military personnel that was due to be married could take a member of the UK family onto the base to the liquor store to purchase alcohol at a, a huge financial saving. Some of the American children attended local schools and I know of one American family who decades later brought their son back to the UK to visit the school that he had attended. Local schools benefited from visits from the American football team and also baseball and basketball teams. Local taxi companies, in particular Kenny Cabs, supported the base in numerous ways. Kenny Cabs donated to the POW MIA Memorial Monument and were often contacted by US personnel to deliver fish and chips and other takeaways to the base. Small businesses in Newbury flourished selling souvenirs to US personnel. Many local businesses would advertise in the local newspaper, in the base newspaper, which was called The Common Crier. Some of the pubs in Newbury especially the clock tower, were very popular with the US personnel. Village pubs also benefited from having Americans living in their communities. The Royal Oak at Etchenswell hosted 4th of July celebrations arranged by their American neighbours. The Berkshire Anglo-American Community Relations Committee would host a regular fete at RAF Welford with support from RAF Greenham Common. And that attracted large crowds from the local community. The chairman was the Earl of Carnarvon, then Lord Porchester. I don't have access to the financial implications on the local community due to the activities of the peace women or when RAF Greenham Common closed, but it must have been enormous. Thinking about the negative side to that time, I can tell you that from my initial interview at RAF Greenham Common, it took three months for me to be vetted before confirmation was given that I had been accepted for the position of publicity and marketing director. I later realized that this was probably checking to see if I was a spy for the peace women movement me. I remember one horrifying experience, driving my Mini to gain entrance onto the main base. 
One day, several peace women started to rock my car, trying to actually overturn it with me inside. There were other times that I witnessed peace women acting in an overtly sexual nature, performing lesbian acts, and obviously trying to shock. One time, I think it was on the anniversary of Nagasaki, I was walking back from my office towards the library when I heard a commotion. Dozens of American children were running up the roads, clearly in some distress. They'd been in the library and when they had come out, they'd been greeted with the sight of naked peace women covered in grey ash and appearing to be hanging on the wire fencing. Not a pretty sight for these young children. I was amazed to learn that many American families had never ventured into the local community at all. They'd been intimidated by the acts of the peace women and thought that the outside community, not just the peace women, would not be friendly towards them. Realising that they were shortly to leave the base and hadn't seen really anything of the UK, I started organising tours to London and Bath and also to Ireland. They quickly signed up for these. Every day in my office, I heard stories of break-ins that the peace women had done and damage that had occurred overnight. Bags of human excrement and rotten food was thrown into the faces of US and MOD security guarding the fences. Absolutely vile. One day I was in the new Sainsbury's supermarket in the Kennett Centre when I could smell something quite disgusting. When I turned into the next aisle, I nearly bumped into the offending smell. It was a peace woman. There were rumours that the peace women were being paid £10 a day for their efforts. The whole peace women experience has left me with many bad memories. However, nothing can take away the wonderful comradeship and friendship of working with an amazing bunch of people that had to put up with so much from such vile women. <clears throat> I had a night and uncle lived in Newbury. Sometimes we'd go up to Green and Common and I'd press my face up against the perimeter fence, look at a huge aircraft. <laughs> God, the noise of the bombers firing up their engines was, well, it was definitely, but exhilarating. You know, when the air tattoo came to Greenham, I was working for a major company that was supplying specialist equipment to the US Air Force. Through 1978 and 79, the site was becoming increasingly active. I mean, it was obvious that its use was going to change, although why and how, we didn't know. Security at the base continued to increase during 1980 and 81, I was advised that my details as a frequent visitor would have to be more vigorously verified and logged. Now, it was at that time I had a career change and I found myself visiting Green and was a rookie journalist tasked with writing about what was now a missile base. Outside the perimeter fence, I mean protesters, mainly women, you know, they were peacefully protesting against what they described as a provocative and dangerous act. Now, that the site was originally common land and was now occupied by Americans served to add to their calls and concerns. I was quickly able to win the confidence of several of the leaders at a protest and was able to write about their aims and objectives. And despite forming an initial opinion, I believed that I was able to remain unbiased in my work. However, when my report appeared in a now defunct but well-known national newspaper, it was edited so as to show complete disdain for the women. I subsequently made other reports, all of which were edited and red penciled to fit in with what I can only assume were government guidelines to the mainstream press. So I bit the bullet and became a freelance journo, you know, which would allow me to submit my reports to the independent media with less risk of having my words distorted. 
Well, I spent a lot of time at Greenham speaking with the protesters and visitors who brought them food, blankets, toiletries. I met visitors from the local area and towns and cities across the UK and other countries such as the USA, Canada, South Africa, France. You know, all were passionate about the cause and had no wish to escalate the protest into a violent demonstration. I also had conversation with the men behind the wire, police personnel, American security staff and contract staff from UK companies that the latter wore uniforms that gave them a pseudo-police appearance and with that came a blatantly obvious posture of aggression. You know, some of them were clearly spoiled for a confrontation. And most seemed to be quoted from the same script when asked about their attitude towards the protesters. The mainstream media had little to write about in the early days, and yet they were being fed stories by the MOD and government spokesmen. Government-sponsored troublemakers were bust in and infiltrated the camps over a period of weeks. You know, they started trying to break into the base, pulled down fences, they, they spat and swore at the base workers. You know, local residents became infuriated, demanded action against those they saw as communists and hippie layabouts. And there were female, sorry, there were stories that, you know, that female spies from Russia and North Korea and various anti-British organisations were disguising themselves as peace women in order to watch the base and assess its security. A large group of hippies, not associated with the peace camp, settled around the River Embourne on the Berkeley Road and spent a lot of time walking around naked to the obvious joy of the news hounds of both the local and the national press. Well, the authorities capitalised on the situation suggested that they were an integral part of the peace protests. Residents against Greenham encampments, rage, you know, they started getting a lot of support, though the peace women's claims that they were not the cause of the disturbances, they were all ignored. On a regular basis, I spent time with some of the key people involved in the peace movement. You know, they were intelligent, passionate about their cause, well-informed and politically astute. And above all, they were intent on avoiding conflict because they knew it would damage their cause. I met doctors, lawyers, university lecturers, along with mums and retired teachers. Now, contrast that with the picture that was being painted of them. Snatch squads were made up of police and civilian contractors raided from various, and they raided various camps and arrested women on random basis for dubious infringements. And in court... Witnesses for the prosecution would try hard to remember the script they'd been given before their appearance. Well, some were successful, but others often fought and looked guilty as they gave clearly false evidence. The women were portrayed as agitators, unpatriotic, work shy, and anything but the truth. Visible from Berry's Bank Road were rows of porter cabins. One became known as the Brown Shed, and unconfirmed reports abounded that this was being used for the interrogation of some of the peace women. Now, I had a private tour of the base immediately after it was deactivated. Viewing the missile bunkers, you know, that was interesting, because it was obvious from the condition of them they'd never been kept in a state of readiness. When the missiles first arrived, TV crews from all over the world, including Russia and China and North Korea, they were all there to see them being taken from the body of the giant aircraft. Oh, it was all very well staged. Too well staged, in fact, which gave rise to the belief that the missiles were nothing more than cardboard tubes and that Greenham was no more than a decoy base. Subsequent convoys from Greenham to selected launch sites, yet they were similarly stage managed. There were a lot of smoke and mirror tactics used to discredit the peace women and divert the public's attention away from other agendas. Anyone who chose to be properly informed knew that. Uh, well, at the time of the peace camp, I was quite a high-ranking officer in the Thames Valley Force, uh, so I worked closely with the officers in Newbury, you know, some of whom had the responsibility of charging and prosecuting uh, the protesters or the offenders. Now, to give you a bit of background, I joined the force in 1950, having done my national service for two years in the armoured division, mainly stationed in Germany, where I saw firsthand the devastating effects of mass bombing and war. As a police constable uh, and later as a sergeant, I was um, stationed around the Thames Valley area. In fact, in 1963, I attended the scene of the Great Train Robbery. Um, and I came to know Greenham Carmen 
very well because I was involved in the international air tattoo there. And then when the protest started, I spoke with the likes of Joan Ruddock and Monsignor Bruce Kent to tell them what would or would not be acceptable. And then um, in 1983, I briefed Michael Hesseltine on what the situation was there. Now, for me, you know, the, 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 the police was really like a family. You know, looking back, uh, I think my career spent the best time to to be in the force, not least because, you know, like me, so many of my colleagues had a background in the armed forces, you know, doing our national service. And it gave us all a, a, a sense of service and camaraderie in the force. Now, the oath we took on joining the force, it meant everything to us. I do solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that I will well and truly serve the king or queen in the office of constable without fear, favor, affection, or ill will. Now, there are all sorts of stories told about the police and Greenham, but you know, for my part, I can honestly say that I believe I honored you know, that pledge in my dealing with uh, women, as did my colleagues from the Thames Valley Force. You know, really, for the most part, we, we got along all right with, with the women. Uh, we got along quite well with them, you know, respecting their right to protest. But nonetheless, you know, we had to get on and do our job. You know, I do think, however, that um, the Americans had a problem understanding this attitude sometimes. Because many of them had experience on Turkish bases where, frankly... You know, democratic rights tended not to be quite so well respected. As for the Americans, you know, generally, you know, we found them to be very cooperative and um, and well disciplined. You know, there were very, very few incidences of Americans being caught causing trouble in, in the town of Newbury. You know, rather, they were, they were very respectful of the local community. You know, our job at Greenham was to keep order outside of the fence while the MOD guarded the fence on the inside and, and I can tell you the Newbury District Council fell out with me because of the reluctance to charge you know many of the protesters who were encamped there you see you know the problem was there are no signs announcing that Greenham was common land and the ownership of large parts of the common was very very unclear you see the thing is you know if the land isn't part of the public highway or privately owned or state owned well then it's not possible to identify you know which law is being broken when somebody camps on it our job was to uphold the law not to invent new ones the most common offenses there concerned obstructing the highway which is section 137 of the highways act 1980 or breach of the peace which is the justice of peace act 1361 now, that ancient act confers upon Justice of the Peace that the power to bind over unruly persons to be of good behavior. Now, at times, the Newbury Police Force, uh, sorry, the Newbury Police Station, I mean, we held dozens of protesters, you know, under that act where they were bound over to keep the peace. Uh, in other words, you know, we gave them the option to promise to uphold the Queen's peace you know, or we, you know, give them a more serious charge, such as obstructing the highway or causing an affray. Now, before Greenham, I, I'd had some experience uh, of the protest at Aldermaston. You know, it's curious, though, isn't it, that, uh, you know, there are never any real protests at RAF Welford, which is just up the road and remains to this day one of NATO's primary bomb dumps. Now, at first, the protest at Greenham was perfectly peaceful. You know, I personally found the women to be very, very sincere and wholly committed and conscientious and reasonable. I mean, they knew exactly, you know, what they were protesting against and they were determined to do it, notwithstanding considerable personal hardship and discomfort. I remember the winters of 1982 and 1983 being bitterly cold. The thing is, the nature of the protest changed when others arrived with different agendas and some of these newcomers were rather more violent and abusive and bent on getting as much publicity as possible for their cause which i could tell you wasn't anything to do with the missiles always 
You know, in fact, sometimes I, I wasn't at all clear what their cause was. And the media didn't help. Um, there were a number of incidences when the protesters you know, played up to their presence and were actively encouraged to do so. You know, there were rumours that uh, actually the media sometimes supplied the women with uh, ladders to scale the fence and even bolt cutters to, to, to cut through it. Now, I expect the women may well have thought they won the battle in the end, but I'm not sure that the decision to remove the missiles really had all that much to do with them, notwithstanding President Gorbachev's declaration that he noted the protest there. What I can tell you is a lot of local people got fed up with the protest, not least because they had some sense of how much the police operation was costing. Although, to be honest, they probably had no idea how massively expensive the operation was to the ratepayers of the Thames Valley and indeed to the taxpayers of the country as a whole. You see, you know, police from Wiltshire, Hampshire, Bedfordshire and Surrey, they were bussed in every day to support the Thames Valley force. And, um, you know, these, these officers, you know, they, they, they maybe spent 16, 18 hours a day on duty when transportation was, was factored into that. You know, they, they usually spent eight hours on shift uh, and then had breaks down at the race course. So the overtime bill was enormous, you know, as was the catering bill for the mess at the race course. Some locals, you know, tried to protest against the protesters. Uh, rage, I think some of them call themselves, you know, ratepayers against Greenham encampments. You know, but whatever they did was oh, largely ineffectual, really, and uh, you know, went unnoticed by both the police and the media. Now, to my knowledge, uh, there were never any casualties during the protest, although I do know, I know, you know, one woman was, you know, tragically killed when she was hit by a police vehicle towing a horse box. But that vehicle wasn't connected with the Greenham operation in any way, shape or form. I mean, it was simply transporting a horse through a show back to its its home base. But the incident was much publicised and, um, well, let's say it was appropriated by the protesters. Now, none of our officers had received any specific training for dealing with protests like this. I mean, we just saw it as our job to keep the peace and uphold the law and, and try and ensure that no one got hurt. And I, I think that this was achieved to a greater rather than lesser degree. Yeah, I, I personally don't have any bad memories of, uh, of, of that time, although I will confess to a slight lapse of professional disinterest on one occasion when one woman was aggressively bad-mouthing one of my officers, calling him a fascist and a brutish and an ignoramus, etc. Now, I happen to know that this particular officer and his wife, who were both committed Christians, had recently spent two years unpaid leave working with street children in India. So I broke my rule of uh, never making a personal comment by informing the woman that uh, the man that she was so viciously accusing of being uh, 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 unhuman and, 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 and evil and in fact probably done rather more for humanity than possibly she would ever do in her life. <laughs> I, I do remember another occasion that did make me laugh. I mean, one, one woman shouted out at us. She said, don't you know what today is? Today is Hiroshima Day. To which one of my officers dryly replied, oh, he said, I thought it was Friday. I like Friday because we have fish on a Friday.